Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from interest.co.nz and welcome to another in our series of Double Shot Interviews where we speak to CEOs, ministers, anyone who's got some interesting points of view on the economy, on politics, on business, and we talk to them for about 10 minutes. And today we've got Rodney Hyde. Welcome to interest.co.nz, Rodney. Good to be here. Uh, Rodney obviously is the leader of the ACT Party and the a local government minister uh, responsible for the super city, the mm -hmm. um, creation of the new Auckland Council. How has that gone from your point of view? Well, good. Um, what we've done is we've got you know our eight councils into one, and we've got the council functioning, which was always a big ask in the time frame that we had. But to me, it was always about first of all getting the governance right, and that establishes the potential to sort out Auckland. And now we have the challenge ahead uh, between central and local government to actually um, provide the infrastructure and the leadership across Auckland so that we can get our larger city performing. But did it actually save any money? A little bit. Um, just take uh, 2,000 staff less, 20% um, off the cost of water. Um, rates were, if you combined all the councils, were going to be something like 7.5%. It's now, uh, we got it under 4. Um, the council's added a percent to take it to 4.9. That's out for consultation. Um, I hope ratepayers will go along to that consultation and say they actually want it less. I wasn't in a position to reorganise what the councils agreed with. I had to take that as a given. And so the savings that we made were actually in administration. So we had a big reduction in terms of management and a streamlining of processes. 4.9% though, that's still twice the inflation rate. Sure, and um, it's you know what the councils decided upon, the previous councils and this council, we made big savings in administration. Um, How big uh, were those savings? Because well, I've heard that it's not quite as big and once you take into account the restructuring costs, it's actually not that much no, better because, off. No, because, no, that's not correct. Um, look, there's a bit of politics about this from both sides, I would guess. Um, if you took the councils, what they were projecting, it was going to be a 7.5% rise in Auckland on average. Uh, we did the restructuring and we put all the costs back into the council. So they've, you know, fully, and then we pre presented a budget. In that budget, we left all the projects that the councils had signed up to. I wasn't in a position to say, look, that's dopey, don't do it. And um, we reduced staff, something like 1,600. Senior staff, we rolled across all the frontline staff. So there was a big saving, something like $90 million. And um, there's now an opportunity to free up property too. So we made big savings in administration. On the water pricing, um, that's dropped 20% across Auckland uh, as of 1 July this year. Um, if you really want to make further savings, and there's certainly a big potential, it's ultimately up to the council and the ratepayers, uh, not the Minister of Local Government. At also looking at the debt that the council will take on, their annual plan talks about an extra $600 million in debt over the next few years and that they're looking to borrow some of that offshore. Are you worried that um, not just Auckland but other councils will be increasing their debt significantly in coming years rather than increasing rates? Well, as you'll appreciate, and certainly your viewers are literate enough to understand this, that we're not bothered by debt depending on what you're doing with the money you're borrowing. So if you're investing uh, wisely and getting a good return, then there's nothing wrong with borrowing you know, to provide infrastructure. Where you get worried is when you're the government and you're borrowing just to fund your expenditure, or if you're a local body authority borrowing and making poor investment decisions. And so I think the key thing uh, when you're looking at a council going to borrow is what are they investing the money in? Is it a good deal? Now, looking at uh, the way that councils borrow, some people have said there's a need for a local government central borrowing authority, yeah. if you like. What's your view on that, and where are we? We uh, had a capital group task force look at that and recommend it. It also came out of the job summit that we had. Since then, with the Treasury, we've done uh, a lot of work, and uh, that's coming to fruition. I'm hoping to make an announcement about that shortly with the... Minister of Finance and uh, you know local government New Zealand. So certainly we've been looking at that. And what are the benefits for tax pay for ratepayers in that? Well, the argument is, and this is what we've been looking at. The argument is, if, if you group, you can get a lower interest rate. Do you agree with that? Well, that's what we've been working on, and I'd say yes. 
Uh, just looking now at the bigger picture, um, the economy has had a shock in the last week. We're now looking at maybe no growth this this year. How do we get get out of it, and what, what's the solution? Do you think, as ACT Party Minister and a member of this coalition, to um, solve and and grow New Zealand again? Well, we have to face reality, um, and I think Kiwis are good at that. Um, politicians aren't, so it's quite a tough time for a politician. But it seems to me that it's sort of easy for the ACT Party because we're the small party that can you know tell it like it is. We were in trouble as a country before this. Uh, just look at the government borrowing $300 million a week. Uh, that's not sustainable. Um, Christchurch is a big hit, not just on Christchurch, but the entire economy. So what do we need to do? Well, growth, jobs, higher wages all come from the private sector. So we have to reject the political knee-jerk stuff that says, oh, government's got to spend more, let's raise taxes or let's put a new levy on. Because all you do is you make government bigger and put further squeeze on the private sector. So what we're saying is, um, this is when political leadership and government has to look at their spending priorities and say, hang on, what's important and what's not? So what would you cut? Oh, I think you've got some obvious ones that Helen Clark introduced since 2004. So I don't understand why we have you know, interest loans free to students. I don't understand working for families where we take a, a working family, tax them hard, and then give them a benefit. Why not lower the taxes? Um, I don't understand a whole lot of government departments that we have and a whole lot of agencies that we have. So I think rather than looking at what we've been doing as a government, looking at departments and uh, portfolios and say, where can we save money? Um, can we cut down on cleaning the windows? We should be saying, hang on, do we need this office? Uh, do we need these people? Do we need this department? I think that's how tough it is going to be on government. Why not just borrow the money? It seems um, governments around the world are doing that. And, yes. And New, and New Zealand is seen as uh, different and better than you know Greece and Portugal. Why can't we just borrow it? Well, basically, if you borrow it, you're taxing people now. And by borrowing it, you're putting the tax into the future. And um, if you were doing that, you'd want to be saying, actually, the money that we're borrowing, we're actually investing so the future will be better. Unfortunately, we know that's not happening. The $300 million a week that we're borrowing is just to cover consumption, just government spending. So there's no investment. So we're taxing now, we're taxing people into the future. And in part, people are smart enough to figure that out. And so they look at current taxes and they're thinking, gee, there's going to be future taxes, so I'll go to Australia, you know, 100 a day. Also, you can see with Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, this is the net effect of borrowing too much money. And we could be there in 10 or 15 or 20 years. So you can't just borrow. Um, you've, actually, you've actually got to pay your way. And Kiwis understand this, but it's very tough for politicians because as soon as you put your ha head up and say, oh, we're going to cut this, we're going to cut that, then out comes the screaming and you don't care. But actually you do care because the only way we're going to sustain ourselves, especially now, is to actually build a strong economy. And it's not a government that builds a strong economy, it's the private sector, and we're squeezing the hell out of it. Well, it's going to be the government's role to rebuild that infrastructure, those roads, those hospitals and schools. Well, be careful uh, there, because it's government's role, certainly, to provide the framework, and obviously there's going to be a big public investment. But actually, you know, the work will be done not by government departments, it'll be the private sector. Um, so hospitals are built, you know, roads are going to be built, but more particularly where the people and businesses invest into Christchurch is going to be based on the business environment that we create. You can't have a government town uh, in Christchurch. It is to succeed, got to be a business town. Now, uh, just looking at the ACT Party yep. and um, your future in Epsom, mm -hmm. do you think you can win in Epsom in, in the election November 26? Oh, uh, of course, but, you know, ultimately it's up to the voters. And it's always tough for ACT, um, so we don't take it for granted. You know, it's tough for ACT because, you know, we tell it like it is. We see that as our job. Um, and uh, we're a small party, and we've got to make the case. I've worked very hard to be the best MP that we can be. Uh, we've worked very hard to support a government and to nudge the government, if you like, to the right and to do the economic right thing. And we've got to make the case this year. Um, our mission statement for this year isn't just to survive, isn't just to ensure that we have a centre-right government. Our job now is to reverse our economic decline because while ACT has had some, you know, 
significant policy achievements in the past couple of years, that is not enough to reverse New Zealand's economic fortunes. We need to do much better. And so uh, the what, only way we can do that is for ACT to succeed, uh, to get more MPs, and then National and ACT can actually start doing the right thing. Do you think the controversies around your overseas travel and the Heather Roy situation have damaged you in Epsom? Oh, sure. You know, politics, you take hits, you know, whether they're justified or not, and we all make mistakes, and you take those hits, and, um, you know, you get disappointed in yourself because you don't, you know, meet the standard that you've set. But what I always try and focus on is saying, okay, um, it's a big privilege and responsibility to be, first of all, a local MP and then to be a minister. And so I've always focused on doing the best job and so the media, you know, they, they, those controversies come and go. But right through all of that, I worked very hard to be a good MP for Epsom, and I never took my eye off those reforms in Auckland. And, um, you know, I'm proud of that. Um, so, yes, the controversies going on in the media about your behaviour or, you know, about things happening in the uh, ACT Party, but actually I kept on with the job because ultimately, to me, that was what's going to impact on the people in Epsom and, indeed, the people of Auckland. And that was a big reform and we pulled it off. Now, since the last election, we've had the global financial crisis. And now there's a real debate going on around the world about whether deregulation, free markets um, actually caused the crisis and whether we need to row back and re-regulate and make markets less free for movements of capital, trade, um, particularly regulation of the financial sector. Do you think that the global financial crisis has disproved the views of, of ACT when it comes to um, fr free markets and the role of free markets? Well, people always take a crisis and a thing like an earthquake or a financial crisis and they'll reach their own political dogma, if you like. And so, um, to me, it's a sort of misstatement of, of, of the argument. It's always about, well, what is the best policy going forward? Always. And I guess my observation would be that I can't imagine how locking a country up in the extreme, and I don't think anyone's recommending that, helps, because you don't have the ups and downs of capitalism, that's true, but what happens is uh, you get yourself so out of whack that it blows up with a bang, and we've seen that in the Soviet economies. So then you say to yourself, well, OK, do we go right over here to laissez-faire economics? That's actually X view. Uh, we should have laissez-faire economics. But what you're finding politically is that we're talking about a series of interventions right but across... Uh, the, the but didn't laissez-faire economics cause the crisis? Well, you could argue that, but I wouldn't. Um, I would say that there's been some disastrous interventions uh, by government um, that have seen um, profligate lending on, on the housing stock in America. But let's not even get into that argument because, to me, the political response is what do you do? And so it seems to me that you do want a financial system that provides some certitude provides the necessary information. And what we can't allow is a whole series of, and this would be my point, nothing upsets financial markets and capital flows more than constant political interventions to try and fix a particular problem because it just creates a whole level of uncertainty, it creates a whole new array of arbitrage and, and movements. So you actually need to think very hard about the framework within which those capital flows are going to occur and actually stick to it. Because the one thing we know about New Zealand, we're going to need a lot of capital flying into this country. But the rest of the world doesn't really operate on a laissez-faire world. Why should we open ourselves up and be less, more laissez-faire than everyone else when um, the, rest, the rest of the world isn't doing that? Shouldn't we just uh, accept that the world will never be perfect and try and, sure, uh, try course, and res I mean, respond to that? No one's suggesting the world's perfect. But ask yourself this. Um, uh, just take the simple issue of protectionism. Um, countries around the world have varying degrees of protectionism. Um, and you can say, well, look, they have that protectionism. We should too. But does that mean that protectionism is good for New Zealand? No, it's not. Um, just because someone else does a silly policy for them doesn't mean that we should do a silly policy. And so what we always have to do is ask ourselves, what's the best framework for New Zealand? You know, what is the best policy? And to me, it is free trade, um, particularly when you're in a trading nation like New Zealand. We have to make the case for others to embrace free trade. And when you look at capital flows, um, 
he said to yourself, well, let's try and slow it down or slow the hot money down or try and interfere it in some way. Are we seriously suggesting that politicians and officials can actually impede the movement of capital to a better result than would otherwise occur, or are they going to hold it and then actually build the pressure up and then it actually causes a, a bigger disruption? And we saw that with a variety of interventions that New Zealand has tried in the past in, in the movement of capital flows. When it, when it blows up, it blows up big. Just uh, finally, you're nearing the end of your first um, three years in, in government. I like the way you say the first three years. <laughs> <laughs> what would you change if you had your time again? Because um, you've been there, you've done it for the first time, you must have learned something. Yeah, you learn a lot. And I don't, you know, we all do, unless you're stupid. Um, funnily enough, I don't go back and say, what would I do different? I've taken those learnings and say, what am I going to do now? And um, to me, um, we have to get a lot more serious on controlling government spending and the spending priorities. Uh, we've got very bad incentives on politicians for spending of money, and that's why I've got the uh, spending cap public veto bill that we've been working on. Um, Where I mean, is that, by the way? Because it's, well, it's nearly three years since uh, you've been in. What's sure, it'll to be it? introduced to Parliament this year and be off to a select committee. Uh, we've worked very hard. I've done a lot on the red tape and I've done help for particular sectors and for particular businesses but overall our regulatory environment is poor and so we've worked on first of all the regulatory responsibility bill, we had a task force work on that and now we've got a new regulatory standards bill that I'm hoping to introduce to Parliament. That to me, those two things would make a big difference. Um, I would have put more attention on that um, but in order to do that, Act needs more MPs. As it stands, we've got five. We're balanced against the Maori Party with five. If we had eight or more, uh, it would be National Act, and then we could nudge them along, basically, to do what National should be doing, which is providing better economic uh, conditions, respecting private property rights, uh, getting government spending under control, um, and um, an end to the dopey stuff that we see in our government. Rodney Hyde, um, the local government minister and the leader of Act, thank you very much for thank coming you, to Interest.co. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was another in our series of double-shot interviews on interest.co.nz.